Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Monday uh, class, or good evening, I should say, for everybody in India. Uh, today, I'd like to speak about a, a puzzling question, and I think it's a question that has probably occurred to all of us at one time or another. We've been asked this question, or we've asked the question to others, and in this world, it's a very complex place and things happen in life. And we often wonder why do good things or why do bad things happen to good people? I remember being asked this question many times about, uh, what was it, 10, 15 years ago or so when that tsunami happened in Indonesia and so many thousands of people were killed. and or at other times when there's been large catastrophes, a person's caught up in something, uh, you know, there's war, war going on now. Uh, in the past, we look at terrible things like the Holocaust or uh, people caught up in situations that uh, they didn't know how they got there. It was a bit of a mass karma. Or look at it a little bit more personally. It's certain, you know, young people die, that they're innocent, it's seemingly children, uh, babies, and we just don't make sense of it. It's hard to make sense of it. And it can lead a person to a bit of despair. And it seems like this world is very unfair. And why do these things happen? And some people, of course, we have the teachings of reincarnation and we have the teachings of karma. But it's not an appropriate thing when a tragedy happens and somebody's like, say, well, it's just all their karma and leave it at that. Now, maybe philosophically that's so, but it's not very satisfying, especially to, for the person that's being affected by that difficult situation that's happening. And even there, Master himself said, mass karma is a very, very complex thing and difficult to understand. And it wasn't necessarily everybody's personal karma to pass away in a very tragic situation of mass karma, but yet they were caught up in it. And you could say, he would say that wasn't their karma wasn't strong enough to avoid it. And I think that probably for all of us, whose karma can, who can we say that our karma is strong enough to avoid something of a mass scale that's happening? And we wonder, and if we're not careful, it can sometimes lead us into a very negative direction. And we begin to lose our faith. We think, how can God exist in a world like that where such cruel things happen? But we have to step back and we realize that Suffering, pain is a constant in this life. But I'd like to offer a few thoughts on this topic today and perhaps introduce a couple of perspectives that we don't often think about when we talk about this, uh, uh, this topic. And I'd like to ask a couple questions of us as well so that we can ponder these questions uh we can you know we can say can we say god i don't understand why these things are happening but i will love you nonetheless in other words i will love without condition in other words my faith is strong and i don't have to understand everything that's going in life in order to be a devotee in order to love god in order to do the right thing. There's an impulse in all of us, and it's very natural, and I'm a classic example of it. I want to know why. Why am I here? Why is this happening? And that lack of understanding is very difficult for me. But I have to say for my own self, this is one of the lessons I've had to learn, is I can't understand. This little mind of mine needs to be expanded my understanding needs to be expanded and i think it was one of the things that has propelled me on the spiritual path that i don't understand but i want to understand but i also i think each of us as devotees we have to realize 
that I will go forward and I will not place conditions. I'm going to love or try at least. I'm going to try to love nonetheless, whether I understand or not, because I have seen people, they've been overwhelmed by grief, perhaps because they've individually been affected by something. And they said, I just don't understand if, if God is in this world, why would he do such things? Why would he inflict suffering on me? And perhaps they, they don't understand why the suffering has come to them. And it, it's inexplicable. And sometimes they lose their faith. People can become quite cynical and they lose a sense of purpose in life. And we don't want this to happen to us. So let's think about this and explore this a little bit. And I want to begin, well, one is I'd say what the immediate thought that came to me and why this topic came up is I have a friend, or I should say, I I have a friend in spirit, but he passed away not too long ago. A person I know, not closely, but he definitely was a friend. And he died in a very tragic accident. It was a total accident. It was a good man. And he, he was caught up in a, a, an explosion. And he was killed in the explosion. And it caused this is this he was a, a devotee also and devotees in his circle of friend, this were in uh, suffering, you know, why did this have to happen? And very typically, a devotee was think we, we love God, masters on our side. Shouldn't we not be some in some way protected from these sorts of things happening to us. And it's a reminder that things can happen to all of us. So, and we don't know what our future holds. So we have to strengthen our spiritual path and our inner spiritual struggles now. And so this fellow, uh, a good man, he was suddenly he was killed and other people were thrown into confusion around him uh, because of that wondering why this should happen. And I want to thinking about this, and the larger question, because that's an individual situation, but then there's these larger things that happen in the world at large. And, and I want to remind us of a story from the Bible. This is from the old Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. It's a story that many people have heard about, but very few people have read. Uh, it's a long story. And it's the story of Job in the Bible. And Job was tested by God. Now you must remember this, uh, this is a fable or a story. So it's highlighted in order to bring out the points that are trying to be made in the story. And one of the lessons that comes from this story of Job is about being tested by God. And so the very first sentences of this story in the Bible start out by saying Job was a good and righteous man. He loved God and he was righteous. And really looking in his life, there was nothing that you could hold against him. But in this story, the devil, Satan, comes to God and God and Satan are having a discussion. Yeah, this is how stories go. They're having a discussion and in this story, God says, oh, Job is a very righteous, he's a righteous and good man who loves God, he loves me. And Satan says, ha, yes, he loves you because everything's gone well for him in life. But if things should turn, how would he love you then? And God says, yes, I believe so. God, Job would continue with his love. And the devil's says, let me test him and see. I don't believe that's to be true. And so God says, okay, I will allow you to test him just to show what a good and righteous man he is. But one condition, you cannot take his life. You cannot take his life. Let him live. And so the devil goes about, Satan goes about testing Job. He has 10 children. All of them die or taken away in tragic circumstances. And Job is in tremendous grief. 
Now, Job is also very prosperous. Things are going well for him in life. The devil takes, and uh, the devil, seeing that he's not broken by the loss of his family, he takes away all his possessions. Everything goes to disaster. Everything, total ruin. He goes into total ruin. And he, Job is stricken by this. I mean, he's obviously sad, but yet he continues to love God. Finally, the devil says, okay, and then he afflicts him with diseases. And the next thing after a long story, and he's one disease after another, Job, his family is taken from him. He's destitute. Everything's been taken from him. And now his body and health are, have gone. And he's afflicted head to toe with boils. <laughs> and he's in constant misery. And, but he continues to love God. And but he's in pain and he's suffering, and he keeps he keeps asking God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? I can't think of why this would be. And so he uh, three friends of his from far away hear about Job's plight and they come to see him, and they start questioning him of trying to discover, interrogating him is the better word, trying to find out what exactly was the problem, but still. They, Job refuses to say, I don't know. I just have not. And they says, oh, it must be. Now, it kind of reminds me of people that uh, they look at other people's trials and tribulations and they say, oh, it's his karma. He must have done something wrong. It's all retribution. He's just reaping what he's sown in the past. And it's, you know, have you ever sort of encountered that or had that thought go through your own mind? Well, this is how these were. They pretty soon they're interrogating him. He says, well, your failure to admit that you've done something wrong is proof <laughs> that you're, you're unrighteous. You know, you should be humble. And Job is, he says, I just can't understand it. I don't know what I did wrong. Now, of course, they're not taking reincarnation or anything like that into consideration. But they go on like this. But he wanted to know why he couldn't help it. But you see... So, the moral of the story here, one of, the, one of the morals of the story is here, and something for us to consider, which is rarely thought of in this way. He was, Job was tested, not because he was unrighteous, he was tested because he was righteous. He was a righteous man, and God chose him as an example to test to demonstrate his righteousness. Now, that's a very interesting thing. God chose him. And it's an interesting way to look at our own tests and trials sometimes. When you have a difficult job, you need somebody to do it, you find a busy person and a competent person, somebody who, can, who is strong, somebody who can do something. If you need to lead, you have a... Uh, a battle to fight in warfare, you take somebody who's competent, who's, who's courageous, even though you know that person, if you're a commanding general, that those people are going to die in battle. You choose those people because they're righteous, because they're strong. And in a sense, God chose Job to demonstrate a point. Now, remember, this is all symbolic, of course, that the righteous will be tested in life. And it's an important thing to understand because people love God because they think, oh, if I love God, everything's going to go well in my life. I'm going to be showered with riches. I'm going to be showered with a happy family. I'm going to be showered with this blessing and that blessing, which, yes, may happen. But what about if those things are taken away from you? Will you still love God? Because if your love is based upon what happens to you outwardly, you have to say that love is conditional. It's not, you're not worthy yet. You have, our love has to be developed to the point where we love because we love. We love, we want to, we love God. And are you righteous in life? Do you do the right thing? Are you dharmic? Do you help other people do you, because of what you're going to get from them? 
of what's going to be returned to you? Well, if you do, your, your friendship is conditional. Or do you do it because it's the right thing to do? You see, this is a point here is being made. And so he, he's making this, uh, this point is being made in this story of Job. But the interesting thing is here, Job still is not satisfied with, he still wants to know why. Because we may love God, we may do the righteous thing, but there's still this impulse within us. Why? I want to know, because that's our human nature. But one of the things that we have to understand that the intellect and the mind is of the ego, generally. And the ego is never going to be able to know God's purposes in life perfectly. And the only way that we're going to truly know is we have to be God's purposes or God's way is to become like him, is to merge our consciousness with him. God's ways are not man's ways. Man's ways are not God's ways. And to know God's ways, we have to merge ourselves into God's consciousness. And Master, when people would ask him all of these very you know, abstruse questions, he would say, don't ask that now. Leave some questions unanswered until you have found God. And then when you found God, he will answer, my mother, she will answer all of your questions at that time. And there was this one story when I told before where he went into a very deep samadhi and he was talking to divine mother and he was talking in his audible voice. The devotees heard him talk to us. Master, Divine Mother, why, why, why do you create this world the way you do? Why? And he was in the state of samadhi and in bliss. And he says, ah, now I understand. Now I understand. You see, but he could not explain that to anybody outwardly. So for us to truly understand, if you want to know God's ways, you must become one with him. Then you will know. But still, Job was not at that point. And so he keeps asking. And God uh, appears to Job finally. And he says, in a whirlwind, you know, a, a, you know uh, like a whirlwind. Uh, that's how he describes it. And speaks to him. And at the same time, his three friends are there as well. And he says, you keep at, you ask why, you keep asking why. And God says to Job, where were you when I created this world? You have not the, in other words, you have not the capacity to understand where were you? This is my world, not your world. The sun, the moon, the stars, these creation, they go according to my will, not yours. So again, we must know God in order to answer these questions. But at the end, in this story, there's one part I very much like. The end, when he appears to Job, the three friends are there too. And God speaks to the three friends. He says, where were you came? How did you, this was your friend? Your job was to console your friend, not to interrogate him. And he was, God was very angry with them. And Job intercedes. He says, oh, bless them. Don't be angry with my friends. They did. They were merely ignorant. They didn't know. And according, and so accordingly, God spares them from his wrath and blesses all of them. And still at the end, Job was not totally satisfied. And I thought, this is, this is us. Until we are merged with God's consciousness, we're not going to know. But yet, he was consoled. And eventually, of course, God returns. All that it was taken from Job, God returns in abundance beyond that. And his children are restored and, and so on and so forth. And his wealth is restored. But he was tested. Now, it's hard to think of that way. Uh, that, that to think in such cosmic terms that we might be tested, but to be able to see the tests that come to us, sometimes it's the strong that have to be tested. 
think of Jesus Christ. His, he had no karma for that. But God used him as an instrument. Now, that's a very extreme example. But the same way, the important thing is to love God unconditionally. Now, you know the story of, think of the, the woman who lost her son. And she went to the holy man in the village said, and who asking, says, God has taken my child. You must help me. You must help return my son to me, intercede on my behalf to return. And the holy man says, oh, yes, but first you must do something for me. You must go to a home, find a home that has not known pain and suffering. And from that home, gather a mustard seed and bring it back to me. And then I will intercede on your behalf. And so she travels the world going from house to house, looking for such a mustard seed in such a home. And in every home she enters, thinking perhaps they have not known suffering, she finds that everybody, every home has known suffering. And she begins to see the suffering and seeing the suffering in the various homes she goes to, she begins to help in each home. And then she goes to another home seeking and she helps in that home and home to home she travels to. And in the process of both seeking and helping, she ultimately comes to realize that nobody is without suffering. And it's in the helping other people with their suffering, she ultimately is able to overcome that pain and suffering in her own heart. Now there's, one third story I'd like to mention. This is a true story. The, there's a story of a man who, he was caught up in the Holocaust in uh, Poland, I believe it was. He was a Jewish man living in uh, the ghetto there in Warsaw. And of course the Jewish population, which was quite large, million people maybe there, they were totally wiped out except for a few. And he was one of those few. He saw tremendous suffering. His total family was lost. And he, he alone amongst everybody, his friends and family survived. And after the war, he made his way to France and started a new life. He remarried and had a children and built up a life for himself in the south of France. And some years passed and he lived in the forest, in a forested area, and a fire began in the forest, and it consumed the whole area, including his home and his family. And he lost his wife, and he lost his family again in his home. And again, he was destitute. And his friends came to him and says, it's terrible. We must find the cause of this fire. Someone cause this is to blame. Now, it was an accident, you might say. Nobody purposefully set fire to it, but somebody, accidents do happen. And people said, let's, we must find the cause of this. And he said, no, I do not want to find the cause of this. And he dedicated the rest of his life to helping to restore that area of France and to help prevent such things from happening to, again. And the question comes up in our own life of why did this happen? But is that really a useful question? There's a, I read a quote when uh, it was from a book that was using this example of this fellow in France as an example uh, to discuss this question. I want to read the quote that he uh, had. He says, we may not ever understand why we suffer or be able to control the forces that cause our suffering, but we can have a lot to say about what suffering does to us and what sort of people we become because of it. 
pain makes some people bitter and envious. It makes others sensitive and compassionate. It is the result, not the cause of pain, that makes some experience pain, some experiences of pain meaningful, and others empty and destructive. And so we can, this, none of what I'm saying here is to deny the existence of karma that comes to play in all of this. And yes, karma does come to play, but is it helpful to, to go back and rehash, why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? I think it can be because life is for our education as Yogananda Ji said, but it's not the first thing we need to do. You could say that when we're in the midst of turmoil, we're in the midst of pain, we're in the midst of suffering, it's not always useful to say, why did this happen to me? But it's better to ask instead the question of, now that this has happened, what shall I do about it? In other words, look to the future. Ask, you could say, a useful question. And in time, you know, because suffering does pass, pain does pass. And that's the time when we look back, you might say, not with a with negative desire to re for retribution or anything like that, but just to learn why did that perhaps might that have happened to us? Maybe we can learn the lessons that time, but in the midst of the suffering, those probably are not the most fruitful time. And to reflect, I think all we can do is try to rise above that question of why did it happen? And what do I do about it now and move forward? And I think this is a lesson of what faith is, is uh, about. He says, yeah, if we must demand to know why something happened before we accept God in our life, we'll find it very difficult to find him. Because you see, our finding him is conditional. It's based upon first God, you give yourself to me. And then if I'm satisfied, I'll accept you. Now you could substitute for the word God, you could substitute faith or you could substitute universal omnipresence, how, whatever you choose, but we have to accept the, you might say the inevitable, the infinite God first. And that's what faith is built upon. Faith upon is saying, I am going to love, I am going to do Dharma. I am going to do the right thing, even though I don't maybe I'll totally understand, but I do know intuitively, you see, the intuition guides me to do that. That spirit within me guides me to do that because it's the right thing. And sometimes that's the only thing that can guide us to do the right thing. I don't know why, but I know it's the right thing to do. And I do that. And then from that faith comes understanding. And ah, okay, now I know why. My love, in other words, is not conditioned by outward circumstances. It's not conditioned by the blessings that I receive. And as long as I keep receiving them, I'll love God. When I don't receive them, well, I'm going elsewhere. You can see, because that's, that's not true love. And I think this is something we might want to remember. We don't know the workings of karma. We can accept the fact that it's there and it probably is wise of us to have that teaching as an understanding that yes, karma is there, but sometimes God chooses the righteous to suffer. Nobody is above suffering and pain as long as we exist 
in this world of duality, this world of relativity, this world of ego involvement, you might say. And so it's, a, it's you might say, a motivation for all of us to accept that God's ways are not necessarily our ways, but behind everything, behind everything, God's love is there waiting for us. And so it's our job, our burden, our opportunity, our blessing to uplift ourselves. And God's hand is reaching down to us, waiting for us to grab. You see, we have to reach up and grab God's hands. And if we do, God lifts us up into that understanding. And none of this is to say that, that, under, that life is random, karma doesn't exist, and an understanding is not possible. But first, we have to develop that faith and acceptance of God's ways. And then, re, and that faith that God is there, that love is always there, that love behind the mystery of this life, love is there it's always a potential and it's waiting for us to reach out and to draw it and in the very act of reaching out we summon that love into us and we come to say like master said ah divine mother now i know why now i know and so it's a mysterious question but perhaps in situations Maybe this will help if you find yourself in those circumstances, because sooner or later, I think all of us do.